Her smell was there, too, all around me. She rolled over, laid her head on my chest, murmured, You okay, baby? I'm good now, I said, and closed my eyes, telling myself to compartmentalize, to take refuge in my own bed with my wife holding me, and rest. But as I hugged Bree, my mind slipped back and forth between images of the Aldasari children under torture and the details of the story Hala told us. Just before I plunged into sleep, I remembered something I'd said to Mahoney the evening before. Confessions made under torture can't be taken seriously. They're half-truths mixed with what the tortured person thinks the torturer wants to hear. Chapter 101 For an hour and a half I slept with no dreams of anything, but then, from the inky depths of my brain, images began to roll. I saw Hala lobbing the grenade at me. I saw Henry Fowler holding a gun to his ex-wife's head and kicking at his children, who became Hala's kids strapped to the torture chairs. The Saudi secret police in their hoods were there as well one carrying the battery, the other holding the ends of the jumper cables. The one with the battery pulled off his hood, revealing himself as Mahoney. The second hooded man tried to get away, but Mahoney grinned grimly and tore the hood off his head. It was me. I was the one who held the jumper cable clamps. Mahoney and I were laughing, enjoying ourselves the way we'd done dozens of times at backyard barbecues and other family get-togethers. My dream self opened the red clamp's jaw wide, looked at the children, and seemed fascinated by the terror they displayed. I clamped the cable to Amina's chair, expecting the arch and trembling I'd seen her exhibit during her torture before. Instead, I heard a rhythmic buzzing noise that broke the spell and roused me from sleep. I was drenched with sweat. Bree rolled over and slept on. I looked at the clock groggily. 3.40 a.m. I needed at least ten, fourteen more hours, but my bladder felt full. And what was the noise that woke me? I slid out of bed as carefully as I could, stood, felt wobbly, and then noticed the message light blinking on my mobile. I picked it up, staggered to the bathroom, and sat down on the toilet because I did not think standing was such a good idea. Before I could check the message, the phone began buzzing in my hand, the sound that had wrenched me from sleep. It was Mahoney. I accepted the call, peed, and grumbled, You a vampire or something? Never need sleep? Yeah, I'm a new character in that Twilight series my kid's always reading, he replied, and I could hear wind blowing hard. Get the nerve gas? We got in a firefight with one of Hala's co-conspirators, Mahoney said. He'd been holding engineers at gunpoint. Sniper got him, and we freed the rail workers. One had been mutilated. His eyeball boiled. That got me more awake. What? An engineer's eye? In revenge, because the engineer had done the same thing to the dead guy's partner with hot coffee. It's a long story for another time, but they, the engineers, said the partner left the train in the first street tunnel and went back toward the entrance, where the third man in the rail crew, a Robbie Simon, had disappeared. You find the organophosphates and the triggering device in car 29? There were three blue barrels with Pinkler Industries labels in car 29, Mahoney replied. But when we opened them, we found sand and gravel. I remembered the enthusiasm Hala had shown when she'd described the plot. She fed us half-truths mixed with what we wanted to hear, I said, furious at myself for wanting to believe her confession so much that I'd set aside my suspicions. My instincts were right. Mahoney said. She stopped the train so other al Isla members could steal the chemicals. My hand shot to my temple. And they're here, in D.C. Last known whereabouts, two miles from Congress. 
Jesus Christ, I said. We're going back to Hala, Mahoney said. I flashed with dread on the image of her kids being tortured. You're going, Ned, I said. I'm done with that. I ended the call and shut the ringer off. I intended to return to bed, but then I realized that I was no more than fifteen blocks from where Hala's accomplices had stolen the organophosphates. So was my family. My first reaction was to wake them all, move them from the area until the three barrels were found and neutralized. But then old habits reasserted themselves. Snow on the ground, I thought. They had to have left evidence around there somewhere. I picked up the phone and called the man I trusted more than anyone in my life. Chapter 102 Omar Nazad sat in the cab of the van, feeling his stinging hands and feet begin to thaw, and stared through the windshield at the 120 cubic yards of snow and ice that still lay between him and M Street. He and the Algerians had broken up and removed at least that amount in the past three hours. They were still only halfway to the road. They hadn't eaten in twelve hours, and they hadn't had anything to drink for six. The snow they put in their mouths seemed to make them even thirstier. Inshallah, the Tunisian kept muttering to himself. The will of Allah. It is God's will that we must suffer and sacrifice and suffer again in order to defeat his enemies. This is a gift. Somehow, a blessing. We should leave, brother, Mustafa said from the passenger seat. I agree, Samad said. Leave while we still can. Nazad looked at them like they were mad. Leave the best weapon the family has ever had? No, that is not what God wants. But what if Allah wants us to get caught and sent to prison? Samad demanded. Shut up, Nazad said. He was sick of the Algerians. How quick they were to cut and run. It had to be the French influence. I have to eat something, drink something, Mustafa complained. I can't help you. Uh, maybe there was food in that shed, Samad said. Water, too. Nazad looked at him again. You didn't search the entire place? Mustafa shrugged. Uh, the shovels and picks were right by the door. Moments later, they were all following the path the Algerians had taken to the tool shed earlier. The door hung open on its hinges, flapped in the wind. They went inside, flashed their lights, and saw a portable generator, a half a dozen power tools, a jackhammer, three sledgehammers, more picks in a row of hard hats, a surveyor's transom, and a cooler. Mustafa and Samad went straight to the cooler, yanked it open, and cried out in delight. Samad grabbed a granola bar and a frozen bottle of Gatorade, shook them at Nazad. Allah be praised! Food and drink, brother! And a jackhammer, Mustafa cried. But the Tunisian paid them no mind. He was staring at a metal box attached to the wall and sealed with a master lock. On instinct, he retrieved one of the sledgehammers and tried to break the lock, but he couldn't. He looked closely at the other tools, now at his disposal, and smiled. Nizad started the generator. Then he plugged in a Benner Nauman rebar cutter. He fit the hasp of the lock into the jaws of the cutter and flipped it on. The jaws bit and snapped it in less than a second. The Algerians had been gnawing on frozen granola bars while he worked. Only when Nazad set the cutter down and pulled open the door to the box did Mustafa become interested. What did you find in there, brother? he asked. The Tunisian was beaming already, feeling blessed once again by God. The first thing his headlamp had revealed in the box was a row of keys hanging on hooks, all neat and orderly and tagged. The first key on the right said, Cat, D6K. Chapter 103 You woke me out of a perfectly good sleep to ride in a sardine can? John Sampson groaned, trying to get his massive frame into Mahoney's Subaru at around four in the morning. He wore a snorkel jacket, hood up, and peered at me blearily from inside the fur trim. 
he took the travel cup of coffee I offered him. Need help checking out a potential crime scene before I call in an evidence team, I said, putting the Forester in gear. All-wheel drive and weighed down with Samson's and my combined 430 pounds, the car moved like a mini tank into the tracks other cars had made going up and down Samson's street. Potential crime scene? Samson asked, annoyed. I don't know exactly where the crime scene is, John, I explained. That's why I need you, to help find it. He groaned, drank the coffee. Why do I feel like I'm two hundred moves behind you, Alex? Because in this case, you are, I said, and I filled him in, finishing with the information that members of Al Isla had likely pulled nerve gas components off a freight train stopped near the entrance to the tunnel system. I know where that is, Samson grunted. Remember running out of there when we were kids? Probably the only time I've ever beaten you in a race, I said. Found a body in the right-of-way there six or seven years ago. I'd forgotten, but now I nodded and said, Emily Rodriguez. Poor little thing, Samson said. What was she, seven? Son of a bitch tortured her something awful before he killed her. I flashed on Holla's daughter, also seven, arching against the electric current, and said, But what do you think? Freeway side of the tracks or M Street? Freeway, Samson said. M Street, you're going to need boots. It's a good walk to the tracks, and they've got construction going there on that off-ramp they've been building forever. But the freeway side is super steep going down to the tracks, I reminded him. Fifty-five-gallon drum weighs a lot and being up on the freeway is just too visible, even in a blizzard. I'm thinking they went in on the M Street side, big walk or not. Hell, what do I know, Samson said. I'm just along for the ride. The snowbanks along 11th Street were as high as I'd ever seen them, like in pictures of Anchorage or Nome. Samson and I had to strain to spot the security fence where 11th Street crossed over the tunnel's mouth. I parked right in the middle of the street above the tunnel, threw on the hazard lights, told Samson to move the car if someone came along. Before he could grumble about that, I got out, went to the snowbank, and crawled up it to the fence. I got out my mag light, shone it down through the chain links, and immediately saw footprints on both sides of the track where it entered the tunnel. Farther back on the bank facing M Street, the snow had been pounded down, leaving a path five or six feet wide. I snatched up my cell phone, called Metro Dispatch, and requested an evidence wagon and full team to join me at the corner of 11th and M Streets. Lucy, the dispatcher, a friend of mine, said it might be an hour before they could get the team there, what with all the snow. John Sampson and I will secure the scene and wait for them, I said. Thanks, Lucy. Snapping shut my mobile, I sat down on the snowbank and edged out, then started sliding. I hit the pavement, landed upright, and was walking back to the idling Subaru, cleaning the snow off the seat of my pants, when I heard a heavy engine backfire and then rumble to life southeast of me, toward M Street. Chapter 104 Praise Allah! When the bulldozer had fired up after he had found a can of ether under the seat and sprayed it into the fuel tank, Omar Nazad wanted to weep. Instead, he thanked God over and over for blessing him, eased off on the choke until the engine ran smooth, and studied the diagram of the control levers until he thought he understood them. The Tunisian looked overhead, saw a toggle switch and flipped it. Small spotlights on top of the bulldozer cab lit up the area directly in front of him. He pulled the lever back, and the blade came under his control, groaned and rose. The Algerians, who'd been standing off to the side, began to cheer and shake their fists. Feeling possessed now, Nizad studied the diagram once more and threw a second lever forward. He felt something engage. He pressed the throttle. The bulldozer bucked, broke free of the ice holding its treads, and began to grind forward through the snow, past the van and toward the 120 cubic yards of frozenness that separated them from M Street and escape. Samad, get in the van, Nazad shouted, 
Mustafa, get up on the bank where you can see the road. Make sure I'm aiming in the right direction.